Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. Hello and welcome to Galveston Unscripted. This episode is beyond special. One of my main goals for this podcast is to exhibit how Galveston has affected Texas, American, and world history. And I have been so fortunate to have multiple guests on Galveston Unscripted to help me tell those stories. I find it fascinating that a little sandbar off the coast of Texas can draw so much attention. Galveston Unscripted has had authors, doctors, scientists, community leaders, and historians, and every one of them has had a passion to tell the full story, to highlight people, locations, or events that have been forgotten to history, swept under the rug, or downright censored. As the creator and host of Galveston Unscripted, my mission is to preserve and promote history, and to make all the content on this platform free and easy to digest. Whether you're listening to a short 90-second audio guide or a full hour-long interview, there is effort being put forth to tell the full story. Not just what you read in history books or what you were taught in school. All of this, whether you're hearing my voice or one of my guests. And to wrap up my statement, I wholeheartedly believe that education is important. To give some context to this episode, I was invited by Samuel Collins III to the NIA Cultural Center on June 20th, 2022. Now, Sam Collins has been on the podcast before, and we discussed Juneteenth and Jack Johnson. I had been asking Sam to join me on the podcast again. This time, Sam brought along a special guest, Mr. Brent Leggs, Senior Vice President of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He is the Founding Executive Director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and a Senior Vice President for the National Trust. The Action Fund is promoting the role of cultural preservation in telling the nation's full history with a focus on advocation on behalf of African American historic places. Brent Leggs is also the author of Preserving African American Historic Places. When it comes to preservation of African American historic sites, the Smithsonian Institution considers his book a seminal publication. In 2018, Brent was the recipient of the Robert G. Stanton National Preservation Award. Brent's passion for elevating the significance of black culture and American history is visible through his work which elevates the remarkable stories and places that evoke centuries of black activism, achievement, and community. Among his many accolades, Brent has taught at Harvard University, Boston Architectural College, and the University of Maryland, and is a senior advisor and adjunct associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Preservation of Civil Rights Sites. And if you are not familiar with Mr. Samuel Collins III, go to the podcast feed and listen to the episode we recorded together a few months back. The content in that episode has been used in other educational podcasts, such as Texas History Lessons. And for a quick reintroduction, Samuel Collins III is a proud husband and father. Sam currently serves as an advisor with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, representing the state of Texas. In 2015, Sam was named the Galveston County Citizen of the Year for his work in preservation throughout Galveston County, the state of Texas, and the United States. Sam has been an instrumental figure in the Juneteenth Legacy Project, the Presidential Pardon of Jack Johnson, also known as the Galveston Giant, and historical projects throughout Galveston County. On any given day, Sam can be seen putting forth effort to preserve history or educating. Let's jump right into this conversation between Mr. Samuel Collins III and Mr. Brent Leggs on the importance of Juneteenth and how the physical location of Juneteenth in Galveston affects the nation and the importance of preserving all history, preserving American history. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to be here at the NIA Cultural Center on June 20th, 2022. And we have a special guest today, Brent Legs. I don't know how you guys want to kick it off. If you want to yeah, go ahead and start. I, I'm here with you to welcome Brent uh, to Galveston for Juneteenth, 2022. Uh, Brent is the executive director with the African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and senior VP at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Thank you so much for coming to Galveston and joining us for Juneteenth, 2022. Thank you, Sam. It is an honor to be here in this amazing city with this rich history and to share this space and time with you. Yeah, we're, we're at the Neocultural Cultural Center, the Juneteenth Legacy Project headquarters. And, uh, you know, last night we had an opportunity to catch uh, a wonderful documentary. Uh, could you give us a little bit of your thoughts or what you thought about that Juneteenth, the Galveston story that was at Moody Gardens? I thought that documentary was beautifully curated. The way that you opened up the 
discussion about the importance of Gavitson's history in Juneteenth and given the historical context and then the interviewees that helped to frame that story, it was powerful and the way the audience resonated with it. So it's my hope that more Americans will get to see the documentary film, learn about the significance of Juneteenth, but most importantly, learn about the important work that African American preservation leaders and public historians like yourself are doing here in Gaveston to tell the full American story. Yeah, well, speaking of preservation leaders, I mean, you are the model for all of us uh, with the National Trust. Could you give the listening audience a little more of your background, uh, how long you've been with the Trust, and how you got into the preservation work and what your current responsibilities are with the National Trust? Yeah, I consider myself an accidental preservationist. So I'm from a little place called Paducah, Kentucky. Ended up going to the University of Kentucky and I got a master's in business and graduated and I started looking for jobs and Wall Street just didn't fit my personality. So I thought, I'm going to go back to school. I love learning. And I walked inside of the School of Architecture and I had this random, unintentional 15 minute conversation with the chair of the Graduate Program in Historic Preservation with Dr. Dennis Domer. And two months later, I was taking classes on architectural history and learning about iconic and gothic columns. And I was somewhat questioning that decision. But thankfully, I was invited to conduct a statewide inventory of historic Rosenwald schools in my homestead of Kentucky. And after a year and a half, I would learn that my mom and dad attended Rosenwald schools. I would learn that Booker T. Washington, in partnership with Julius Rosenwald, created a social movement in response to a crisis in black education. And ever since that moment in time, I've dedicated my career to preserving places associated to the black American legacy. Today, I am the founding executive director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. It was created in the aftermath of Charlottesville. And you remember that moment in 2017. In particular, that moment on the campus of University of Virginia around a Thomas Jefferson sculpture where we saw white men at the dead of night in khaki pants and polo shirts holding tiki torches, literally looking like our neighbors shouting, you will not replace us. It was one of these rare moments where historic preservation was part of a national discourse. And what we saw there didn't express our cultural values. And we knew it was an opportunity for historic preservation to provide national leadership. And so our idea was to create the, the fund, a $25 million campaign to support the preservation of 150 black history sites nationwide. In essence, our work is about confronting the miseducation of Americans and elevating the contribution of black Americans to this nation. And I'm proud to say that in just over four years, we have raised almost $85 million. A little bit higher than that $25 million goal, right? <laughs> exactly. So you're an overachiever. I am an overachiever uh, for sure. But of course, this is in partnership with an esteemed community of National Advisory Council members and others like Darren Walker and Felicia Rashad, who are the co-chair of the Action Fund. But yeah, 85 million, 200 preservation projects supported across the country. And in essence, we are revolutionizing preservation practice. And it is beautiful that the first generation of academically trained black professionals in historic preservation are centering blackness at the core of our democracy. And, you know, as you spoke about uh, these places, mm -hmm. uh, of course, Galveston is one of these special places. Uh, this southwest corner of 22nd and Strand, of course, is where uh, Major General Gordon Granger set up his union headquarters and the reason why we have Juneteenth. Um, so as I travel the country, uh, see incredible examples of case studies of work that's being done in other communities while I'm not professionally trained as a historian or academically certified, I've, I've been kind of on the ground with the National Trust at, on the Board of Advisors for uh, 15 years now. It's hard to believe because they, they used to have a term limit of nine years, and then they allowed you to go year to year based on your willingness to participate. And I've decided to stay engaged and continue this work. So we began 
looking at, uh, you know, reimagining monuments and memorials in public mm -hmm. spaces. So last year's uh, Juneteenth mural project, 5,000 square feet of just beauty, right? Just uh, inclusiveness mm -hmm. and expanding and telling the full story. So, you know, the national campaign of the National Trust to tell the full story, uh, we attempted to do that with the mural. So when you when you walked up uh, yesterday, when you arrived on Juneteenth, actually, uh, what did you think about the mural? So, as you know, Sam, this is my first visit to Galveston. And I was so excited to come to this city to check out what's been happening. And I couldn't wait to see the mural in person. One, I was inspired by the scale and beauty. It is a powerful intersection between art and interpretation and the way that you begin to understand the meaning of that site and location and telling the story of Juneteenth. I thought it was also powerful in the historical context and, and the representation in that art to see Harriet Tubman represented, you know, the Moses of her people and the contribution she made to the Underground Railroad. It was amazing to see living history being communicated with Opal Lee, who we all know. Grandmother of Juneteenth. Grandmother of Juneteenth, who in 2016 walked from Fort Worth, Texas to Washington, D.C. in her advocacy for this national holiday. I'm inspired by your leadership. Not only have you worked in service of the National Trust in helping us to create a more equitable field of practice, but your leadership in partnership with this community is a national model. And I can't wait to see how other communities can leverage the power of place, the historic places that stand to tell their story, and integrating art as a form of justice to be able to educate the public about local and national history. You know, you know when we uh, do this work, we don't do it alone. Uh, we need allies and support. Mm -hmm. So the co-founder of the Juneteenth Legacy Project, Ms. Sheridan Lorenz, who is a Mitchell descendant, uh, she seed funded the project and basically got it off the ground. And her voice and her involvement was so important to the project, it wouldn't be possible. We all have great ideas, right? It's mm -hmm. like having an automobile that uh, doesn't have fuel to go, unless it's electric, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and with current gas prices, we all wish we had electric right now. But, you know, these ideas are sitting there waiting to move, but they need the fuel or energy mm -hmm. to get going. Uh, she was that uh, partner. Uh, both uh, public and private, uh, behind the scenes, encouraging and supporting, uh, doing many things that people don't know about. Uh, Mitchell Historic Properties owns the building that we're in, the old Galveston Square building. Uh, they gave us permit, permission to do the mural on the side of the building. But then also we partnered with uh, a local nonprofit organization, the Nia Cultural Center, mm -hmm. a young lady that works with them. Uh, Tarina Harris suggested that why not partner with a minority led uh, nonprofit that has been doing work in this community. So while we organize the Juneteenth Legacy Project as a 501c3, the ultimate goal is to uh, merge that into the Nia Cultural Center and let them be the lead and give them support. So this space they leased and, and allowed us to have this uh, space to put up this beautiful our first Mitchell Historic Properties um, donated use of the space for several months before we got a mailing grant. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten uh, national attention with organizations like the Mellon Foundation. We've gotten support from local foundations and, and groups like the, the Moody's and Kempner's and Mitchell's. And I hate to name the list because it's, it's a long list and, and you're going to leave somebody out. But just to look at the list of supporters, uh, you see who is uh, putting action behind the words of uh, supporting projects like this to make sure that we tell the full history. 
Uh, so I wanted you to speak to how important it is to have those relationships and uh, partnerships of people to support because you don't set a goal of 25 million and get to 85 without having support. Mm -hmm. So could you uh, speak to how important that is, that allyship and and support by those that control assets and resources? So it's not just money. Mitchell Historic Properties controls the space of the building. So they had to give us permission to be in this space when it was vacant. They had to give us permission to put the mural on the side of the wall. And yes, they they did get finances, too. So we're thankful for all of that uh, to the family and the the leadership of Sheridan Lorenz. But could you speak to that a little more? Yeah. I don't know if enough Americans understand that the work of preserving place is meant to happen in perpetuity. It means that we have to invest in preservation's future. So I'm honored that Cynthia Woods Mitchell, who has created a a grant program to help conserve historic interiors, it's an endowed fund at the National Trust where we provide annual grant making. And she is, she and her family and their support. That was Sheridan's mother. Uh, she's passed away, but that was Sheridan's mother, Cynthia. Oh, Lewis. that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that family's legacy in supporting preservation is critically important. Under Elizabeth Alexander's leadership at the Mellon Foundation, the way that they are investing in historic sites that that helps to expand the American story is critically important. With the Action Fund, we were able to launch with $3 million investment with a leadership of $1 million gift by the Ford Foundation. Some of our signature investors is the Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the JPB Foundation. We were fortunate enough to receive a $20 million investment from Mackenzie Scott and Dan Jewett last June. Wow. And it was it was close to Juneteenth, wasn't it, right before it that? It was. Yes. Yeah, it sure was. And it was a welcomed contribution that really amplify the importance of the fund's work and the significance of historic preservation. And then more recently, we received a $20 million gift from the Lilly Endowment to pilot over the next three years a Preserving Black Churches project. So as you just described, it takes a coalition of partners to invest in this work, to advise, to create space for black leaders and preservationists to to begin the work of telling the full American story. And I loved the word that you mentioned earlier, descendants. As preservation continues to evolve, we are realizing the critical importance of creating room for descendant voices and, and leaders. And before I got here to, to Gaveston, I was at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello And they had a two-day program with 450 descendants of that site of enslavement and plantation. And they had a dedication, a rededication of the African burial ground. Or as I think about the work of the descendants at James Madison's Montpelier, who today have 50% representation on the board of trustees and the chair of the board led by James French as a descendant of that historic site. Wow. What an example to the rest of the nation of inclusiveness. And not only um, oftentimes we we think of diversity uh, sitting at the table of different individuals, but having an equal voice. So having those leadership roles is different than just having a seat at the table. That's exactly it. So, In 2018, in February, we convened 50 descendants, preservation professionals to develop a rubric on teaching slavery interpretation and descendant engagement. And that rubric was the roadmap for securing structural parity and co-equal governance at James Madison's Montpelier. It has resulted in a new world model for the stewardship a presidential sites and historic places. So I, I just share that background to say that I am so delighted that descendants here in Galveston are part of the reimagining of American history. 
I am so proud as I look across you and we have this conversation again in your ongoing leadership and vision. And I am so excited to see what happens in this city 10, 15, 20 years from now and the way that you all will help to expand our nation and the world's understanding of Juneteenth and the contributions of Galveston. Yeah, I I think about, you know, the historic structures. We're sitting here on the north side of a building that's currently being restored. Um, And in the preservation community, you take these old structures, adaptive reuse. Uh, Sometimes they need foundation work. They got to be rewired, replumbed. Uh, They need a new paint job. Uh, That's the physical structure. Mm -hmm. But when I think about America's narrative, the history uh, it needs a renovation. Uh, we, we're all on the deed of this American house. We, we love America. We love Galveston. We love our communities. But these houses have cracks in the foundation. They, have, uh, they need new roofs uh, in order for this home to be here for future generations. So the examples that you give, those places are, are renovating their narrative. We're trying to do that work here in Galveston to be more inclusive of those that did contribute to the success of the island. So uh, here in this building, oftentimes I take people into the hallway to see the bricks that uh, often have the fingerprints of the enslaved people. Uh, Could you speak to that a little bit uh, of of that experience across the country when you're working with different communities of descendants, as you were talking, uh, being involved uh, because many people walk by, those walls, those bricks, and never think about the contributions of those that actually built the structures, built the city, and built this capitalist system we live in. Yeah. So through our national grant program, we have invested in 106 preservation projects nationwide. And on July 15th this year, we will announce additional investment in probably 33 grantee projects. Over the last several years, we've invested in four projects here in Texas, including the project led by Andrea Roberts, the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. Yes, over 500 identified locations. Yes, I'm feel, I know Dr. Roberts well. Yeah, she is an amazing leader in historic preservation, and her work, of course, is housed at Texas a and University. Whoop. I had yep. to throw that in there. I'm an Aggie. <laughs> Aggie graduate, so I know you weren't expecting that. <laughs> we also have invested in Houston Tillerson's University. And in 1914, black students helped to build the old administration building. And the windows needed restoration, so we helped to fund that work. Recently, we provided $50,000 investment in the historic Olivewood Cemetery led by descendants in Houston. What I think is powerful about this cultural landscape is it's Houston's first black cemetery. 4,000 black people are buried there, but 500 were living witnesses to Juneteenth and emancipation. And unfortunately, our work was investing in a drainage plan for the site because of the inappropriate development surrounding the site with the water runoff, mm-hmm. and then also the increased impacts, negative impacts of climate change. So we are supporting that project and just listed them this year on America's 11 most endangered historic places, along with historic Brown Chapel in Selma, Alabama. And then we've also funded two new staff positions. One is with Houston's Freedman's Town Conservancy. And I'm sure you have walked those streets with those original brick roads that brings life to the story of 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 Freedman's Town and then 10th Street Historic District as well. There are so many historic places around the country, like the childhood home of Nina Simone in Tryon, North Carolina, or the Langston Hughes House in Harlem, where we're developing a stewardship plan to ensure that. Harlem has a black future. We need more Americans to understand that our work in historic preservation isn't just about equitable interpretation, but this work can be a catalyst for 
equitable revitalization and economic development. And it is a strategy for reviving and returning historic black neighborhoods back to the community. Well, you know, when you speak about economic development and heritage tourism, I mean, Galveston has a unique opportunity here with Juneteenth now being on the national calendar. How many cities have a national holiday associated with it because of a single event? So I'm excited about what the future does hold. You know, when you talked about Nina Simone, I'm looking at her behind you that we hung that just for you. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, we hung that just for you. I know your work there with uh, saving her home and. Wanted it to be up when you got here, uh, and uh, the artist will pick it up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so if people are listening and they want to come see Nina Simone, you're going to have to look at a photo because it's going to be removed soon. But he's taking it to another show, but he, he'll be back, Eddie Fowler. So here we have uh, Eddie Fowler, Earl Jones, Chase Sampe. The featured artist is Ted Ellis. We also have Dan Trail Boone, Matthew John Batiste. Uh, Samson, uh, Bimbo at Bay, this piece called Forever. Uh, so, you know, the importance of having these positive images uh, for people to see mm-hmm. is also uh, critical to our work because often uh, African-American stories are so tied to civil rights, slavery, pain, suffering. Uh, but I'd like you to just speak to a couple of more examples of those positive stories of individuals, because we have positive stories here in Galveston, like John Rufus Gibson, uh, second principal of Central High School from 1888 to 1936. And you think about 48 years as a principal at one location. There's not a school, a library, uh, street or anything named after him. Could you speak to the importance of mining those Mm -hmm. diamonds in the rough and using those as examples so people don't think that it's always about pain and suffering because it's it's so much to the African-American experience here. Um, The A.J. Gaston Hotel. Mm -hmm. Let's use that as an example. So I set that up for you. (laughs) Yeah, you did, because, you know, the A.J. Gaston Hotel is beloved in my heart. And I will be in Birmingham, Alabama at the end of the month as part of a celebration following the $10 million restoration of the 1954 wing in that motel. So just for the the listeners, A.G. Gaston was the most successful black entrepreneur in the state of Alabama during Jim Crow. In 1954, he constructed a mid-century modern hotel, kind of modeled after the architectural style of the Howard Johnson Motel. And as I think about his life, I bet he had no idea that in the spring of 1963, the entire civil rights movement would descend on that motel. They would plan and implement the Birmingham Birmingham campaign known as Project C. And those efforts would break the back of segregation in the South. And so when I look at that historic place, and how it is deeply imbued in the legacy of civil rights. I think about the the known names like Dr. King and Reverend Shuttlesworth and Reverend mm-hmm. Abernathy, but the unknown foot soldiers who were armed only with the truth in a spiritual battle against immorality. They would test and affirm this time, test and affirm this timeless idea that purposeful collective action can change our nation and the world. And I am deeply gratified that the AG Guest Motel in Birmingham, Alabama is the centerpiece of the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument, which President Obama designated in his last week of office. You've got places like Madam C.J. Walker's Villa Lawaro in Irvington, New York. Yes. Like who knew? (laughs) Who that, knew that America's first self-made female millionaire would construct an Italianate mansion for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars? She would integrate the most expensive zip code in the United States at the time before women had the right to vote. And she would build this mansion on the same street as Jay Gould's Lindhurst and three miles from the John D. Rockefeller State called Kaikit. You've got iconic places in American history like 
the Gaston Motel, Villa Loaro, the National Association of Colored Women headquarters in Washington, D.C., the Lions Luster Mansion in Oklahoma City, Whiffendale Ladies Club in Los Angeles. There are so many places that expresses black joy, entrepreneurship, political activism, and so many stories, as you just said, that moves the black experience beyond the stereotypically defined understanding of slavery or civil rights. Our contribution to American democracy is invaluable. And the way that our nation begins to understand that value is through touring and touching and having an immersive interactive experience with historic places. Yeah, and I, it's great that you use that immerse word because I tell people you can read about Juneteenth, you can watch a video or documentary on Juneteenth, but to really be immersed in the story, you have to be in Galveston where it started. So you read about swimming, you watch a video on swim, but sooner or later you got to get in the water. That's it. So, you know, we are so glad to have you here in Galveston, in the water where Juneteenth began. So, you know, we talk about those iconic figures, but I just mentioned John Rufus Gibson, someone that, you know, few people knew of his contribution to this community over 50 years as an educator and so many other things that he did. Uh, The late Reverend James B. Thomas, who I believe was a 1941 graduate of Central that was uh, one of the early supporters of getting Juneteenth recognized as a state holiday in 1979, working with the late state representative Al Edwards. Um, There are uh, those historic figures, but there's also Big Mama and Mm -hmm. Papa and the stories uh, of those behind the scenes doing the work that communities could benefit from sharing their stories too. So I'm inspired by the work and the examples the National Trust puts forth to uh, let us know it's possible, right? So it's possible uh, for Galveston. So, you know, we're going to have an opportunity to take you through uh, the Freedom Walk Tour just to let you see the the pier area, you know, that you saw in the documentary where the soldiers came in. This downtown historic strand district that is home to so many Uh, events publicly here in this community. And now there's an opportunity uh, to be inclusive and add Juneteenth, not take away anything Mm -hmm. from any of the other celebrations, but just to expand. If we have 7 million visitors to the island, we need to get to eight to 10, right? Uh, It's to grow the pie, you know, not to cut it up and uh, take away from anybody else. So, you know, we have a great opportunity. And then, you know, from this corner over to the 1861 U.S. Custom House, uh, which uh, had a printing press there where uh, amnesty oaths were printed and uh, soldiers had to sign Confederate soldiers where the handbills were were printed uh, related to the five general orders and general order number three. And when you mention churches and the initiative to uh, save those historic black churches, the colored church on Broadway that we drove by yesterday as they were wrapping up from their historic march from the courthouse square to Reedy Chapel. It wasn't called Reedy Chapel in 1865, but this church was established in 1848, 17 years before enslavement ended. Uh, Second oldest African-American church in Galveston. The oldest is actually Avenue L Baptist church started in 1840 Hmm. by five enslaved people 25 years before slavery ended. Uh, Texas did not become a state till December 29th, 1845. So this church is older than the state of Texas, 182 years this year. And then of course, the last stop on the freedom walk is Ashton Villa, uh, the 1859 home. Uh, GHF has an amazing, uh, and still we rise exhibit there. Uh, Hopefully we could get you in to see it while you're here in Galveston. Uh, But that is all new uh, things that have been added since the popularity of Juneteenth has increased. 
So that shows, to your point, the economic opportunity for heritage tourism, mm-hmm. um, the uh, importance of highlighting these sites. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything that you'd like to share uh, with the listening audience about the work and encouraging them to support uh, this and 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 also support the National Trust. The the last thing I'll say before I uh, turn it back over to you, uh, the interconnectedness of these communities. For example, Wilberforce University, founded in 1856 in Ohio. If not for Wilberforce University, some of the individuals from Galveston, Mr. Uh, Ralph Albert Skull, uh, his, uh, I think his three great uh, two great, great, one great granddaughter was in the documentary. Uh, he went to Wilberforce University and graduated in 1882 or 83, came back to Galveston with John Rufus Gibson. And together, those two men, graduates of Wilberforce University, established the first black high school here in the public high school in the state of Texas, modeling it after Wilberforce. Could you speak to how this interconnectedness is important in telling these stories is important to the work that we do. So that interconnected elements of, of the black experience, the epicenter of the black experience starts with the black church. And as you just beautifully described, it is the building blocks and the infrastructure for creating black community. We must invest in the preservation of historic black churches that are cultural assets that not only support the religious health of our communities, but also open up their their spaces for cultural and social justice programming. They matter. Rosenwald schools historically black colleges and universities that educate our communities and others who have over decades had inequitable public and private investment to support the preservation of their physical assets and cultural legacy. These places matter and deserve the same stewardship as Thomas Jefferson's Monticello or New York City's Trinity Church. When I start to look at all of the other historic places around the country and I begin to understand Galveston's role in American history, there are these bookends. Foundational moment is 1619. And Fort Monroe today is a national monument that helps to tell the story of the first European slave ship to arrive to this new world with its enslaved Africans. We all are descendants of that foundational moment in American history. The other bookend is June 19th, 1865 and the legal ending of slavery in the United States. Galveston's story in American history is so unique and powerful. And I would encourage the public to invest in your organization, invest in your ideas. I would encourage the public to invest in the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund because we believe in abundant and resource-rich future for the preservation of African-American historic places. What I believe deeply in my soul is that not until black history and the places imbued with that legacy matter will black lives and black bodies matter and that they are one and the same. Together, we have an opportunity to tell a more accurate American story and an opportunity to uplift the full contributions of black America to our nation. 
this is the importance and power of this work. And I cannot express my gratitude to you and all of the remarkable leaders who advocate for telling this important American story. Thank you so much for coming to visit us here. And as you spoke about the HBCUs, uh, I'm going to end just talking about Texas A&M University and Prairie View A&M University working together to try and design a Juneteenth museum for this community. When we think about this PWI founded in 1876 and this HBCU founded in 1876 during the same time because of segregation and the black legislators during reconstruction that advocated one of them being from Galveston, George T. Ruby elected in 1869 advocate. He had been born free and relocated here after the civil war, but that was also a former enslaved individual, Matthew Gaines, a uh, state Senator, uh, here in Texas, doing reconstruction, those two state senators pushed for this public land grant college, uh, both of them, to be established. And here, because of the events on the southwest corner of 22nd and Strand, it gave them the opportunity to push and advocate for public education. And these universities that over time have been divided, one with billions of dollars in an endowment, and the other had less than a hundred million until recently McKenzie Scott again mm-hmm. all over planting seeds and making investments in communities and, and in these HBCUs. But now they are working together. So Juneteenth can be that healer to bring communities together. The the bill that is here at the Neo Cultural Center and Juneteenth Legacy Project is a direct result of the collaboration between these two institutions and the students represented on the boards, working together. That's how we're going to make this country better. That's how we're going to make this world better. That's how we're going to make the preservation community better that we work with by working together. So again, we are so honored to have you here in Galveston, Texas, the birthplace of Juneteenth. And don't let this be your last time. Come Come back. Of course. And we're going to give you some time this afternoon to enjoy the beach and just relax. Mm -hmm. You know, put your shades on. Nobody will know you here. (laughs) (laughs) Just relax and enjoy this beautiful island. But I am Samuel Collins, the third certified tourism ambassador promoting all things Galveston. Galveston Island, the birthplace of Juneteenth. Thank you for listening in to Galveston Unscripted. Be sure to check out the link in the description for more context, more history, and to connect with us on social media. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. And make sure to check out the Galveston Unscripted website. We have 90-second to 4-minute audio guides describing history, nature, culture, all over the island. And a special thank you to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Mr. Brent Legs, Sam Collins III, the NIA Cultural Center, and all of you who have supported Galveston Unscripted, Galveston History, Texas History, and American History. And we'll see you next time on Galveston Unscripted. For historic resources or more information, check out the episode description.